be helpful if you've uh, got that passage open in front of you, Philippians uh, chapter 1. We're going to be looking at that uh, in a moment. Now, um, a few uh, months ago, at the very beginning of lockdown, I read an article in a newspaper that encouraged Brits to make the most of lockdown. It said, why not learn a foreign language? Why not uh, take up a musical instrument or develop a new hobby? Well, have, have you done any of that? I've developed a new hobby. Uh, it's called eating my own body weight in chocolate. I've become very good at it over the last uh, few weeks and months. Now, for most people, in all seriousness, lockdown has not been a time where they've thrived. For most people, 2020 has not been uh, full of joy, full of uh, uh, getting great things out of life. In fact, it's been the opposite at times. It's felt like a slog. I imagine that's uh, certainly been your experience. It's, it's been mine. Um, but lockdown now is beginning to ease. Life is becoming a little bit more easy. Uh, the joy is sort of coming back in stages. Perhaps you've seen friends recently that you haven't seen for a while. You've gone places you haven't been. Perhaps you've even hugged uh, family members or friends that you've not had any sort of contact with uh, for such a long time. The joy is becoming uh, back into life. Normality is creeping back in. But it's one thing to find joy in good times. It's quite another to find joy in the hard times. And that's where we get to the book of Philippians. Because uh, in the book of Philippians, the Apostle Paul says that he has learned a secret. A secret of being content. He says in any and every situation, he's learned the secret of being content. Whether he's well fed or hungry, whether he's in plenty or in want, he is content. And the theme of joy, of contentment, of happiness is one that we're going to see a lot in the book of Philippians. Paul says you can be uh, joyful, you can be content, even in the worst of circumstances. Now you may think, well that's you know, easy for an apostle to say, he's literally an apostle. Um, of course he would say that. But Paul expects that, Paul wants that for ordinary Christians, for, for you and me. In fact, look at that passage uh, we've got in front of us. In uh, Philippians chapter 1, verse 25, he says this. I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith. See, Paul's ministry to the Philippians was for their joy. He wanted them to experience uh, that deep-seated joy a joy that could be present uh, no matter what was happening in their lives. And so we're going to see over the next uh, few weeks as we get into Philippians. Philippians is a book all about joy and how we can experience joy uh, no matter what we're going through. That's where we're going to go. Now, a little bit of background uh, for Philippians is really important as we begin the letter. Uh, the letter to the Philippians was to a church in Philippi. And that was a church uh, that Paul planted, Paul started in AD 49. You can read about it in Acts chapter 16, and that's where Luke records uh, Paul uh, doing these things. And uh, as he uh, preached the gospel, as he proclaimed Jesus, as the church was planted, um, you may, if you know the story, may know uh, a prominent businesswoman, a lady called Lydia, was uh, one of the, the key converts at the beginning, as was a Philippian jailer. But this letter to the Philippians is about 10 or so years later. And things have changed a bit. The Apostle Paul is uh, no longer out planting churches, he's in prison. And the church themselves are getting opposition from the outside. The culture was hostile to the Christian faith. And not just uh, problems on the outside, there were problems on the inside as well. There was selfish ambition, there was uh, vain conceit, as he talks about in chapter 2. Uh, there were little problems, little tensions under the surface. Not major divisions, like you see perhaps in Corinthians, but nevertheless, problems, perhaps the odd snarky text message or WhatsApp message went about. Just a little bit under the surface, things bubbling away, tension within the church. And so Paul writes into that context and he wants to remind them of the hope that they have to correct some of those issues and to give them joy. Joy, uh, no matter what they're experiencing, what they're going through uh, in life. And our chapter, chapter one, is all about that. And Paul in chapter one gives two reasons uh, why they can rejoice, two reasons to find joy. The first is that the gospel produces fruit. The gospel produces fruit. Just look at the impact the gospel has. Uh, verse six. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Jesus. 
Paul says he is confident that this good work that God has started in them, it will continue to bear fruit, not just uh, for one moment, but continually throughout their lives until the day of Jesus. The gospel will bear fruit. And that's uh, also what he says in verse 11, uh, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ. There is a fruit that will endure. The gospel uh, will have an impact. The gospel will produce fruit in their lives and as we're going to see throughout the world, throughout other people's lives too. In fact, uh, verse 11 says, uh, the fruit uh, comes through Jesus Christ. You see, uh, the fruitfulness that Paul is talking about, that he wants them to find their joy in, uh, comes through the gospel. Gospel is a word that Christians often use. It means good news. Uh, The gospel of Jesus, his death, his resurrection, his ascension back into heaven, all the good things that Jesus has done to secure our salvation, to make us right with God, well, that produces something. It produces fruit. God is committed to uh, carrying on uh, the work of the gospel, that it will always uh, produce fruit. It will produce fruit in their lives, he says. And Paul is so confident of that that he will say that no matter what happens in his life, he knows that the gospel is going to make an impact. Just look at verse 12. Now, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear uh, throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I'm in chains uh, for Christ. Because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. Uh, Paul is confident that in his circumstances, the gospel is going to advance. Now, that would uh, perhaps be very surprising uh, to the Philippians because Paul is in prison. It's a reference to uh, being in chains. It comes up quite a lot in the book. He's in chains. He's in prison. He's stopped, hindered from going out and uh, proclaiming the message of Jesus. Now, you might think, you'd be forgiven for thinking, that that hinders the gospel work. Surely the great church planter of the first century being in prison, well, that hinders the work of the gospel, doesn't it? Paul says no. It advances the work of the gospel because the gospel will always produce fruit. It advances uh, the cause of the gospel because it's become clear to those uh, in the palace guard, those prisoners, uh, sorry, those soldiers around him in prison guarding him. It's become clear to them that Paul's in chains for Christ. Presumably he's told them about Christ in the palace guard. He shared the gospel with those around him. And it's even emboldened other Christians to share the message. Verse 14. Even in uh, the very worst uh, place that Paul could be in, a terrible existence it must have been uh, to be in prison in the first century. You would think it would be a hindrance uh, to gospel ministry, but Paul says, no, 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 the gospel will bear fruit. It will always have an impact in the world. It will always be advancing, he says. It has served to advance the gospel. Now, uh, for many businesses, the last few months have been terrible. Not being able to meet up physically has obviously been a disaster for uh, so many businesses. Um, I was chatting to somebody recently who was telling me about someone that they knew, someone who had been working for a decade to build up uh, a business as a personal trainer. He'd uh, hired staff, he'd worked really hard, and in lockdown, it's all gone. It's all gone. For a while, he did some online stuff, but it's just faded away. Uh, His business has shut and he's had to find a new job in a completely different career. Now, maybe that's been your experience. Maybe you know people who have had some of that experience uh, for themselves. Businesses have really suffered uh, in this time over the last few uh, months. In fact, just this week I saw the uh, rumours of 450 jobs going in the Celtic Manor. Being physically distant from people is a disaster for most businesses. It's not been a disaster for the church. It's not been a disaster for the church. We've been able to go online. Now, of course, it's not the same, is it? It's hard. It's hard uh, not seeing each other. It's hard preaching into a camera lens there and not seeing all your uh, lovely smiley faces. But it's not been a disaster. Elsewhere in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul says, the word of God is not bound. God's word goes out. The gospel advances. Even in difficult circumstances, which are far from ideal, 
the word goes out. And it may be that you're watching this morning and you've actually never physically been to our church building. You've never physically been at a meeting before. Perhaps you don't really know how to pronounce the word pontredrin. Nobody knows how to pronounce that word. But you've not been part of a service and yet you're watching online. And it's great you're with us. It really is. It's a sign of, of what's happening here in Philippians 1. Uh, the gospel advances no matter what happens. And because of that, Paul can be confident. He is confident uh, that uh, the gospel will go out and he can find joy in that. He's so confident that the gospel will go out. He even says that even in bad motives, he can rejoice. That's what 15 to 17, uh, 15 to 18 rather is all about. He says some are preaching Christ out of rivalry, out of envy, out of uh, selfish ambition, verse 17, trying to stir up trouble for Paul. Now, it's hard to know exactly what is going on in these verses. It seems that when Paul is in prison, other people have been sort of pushing themselves forward, trying to take on the, the mantle, trying to take on the role of being one of the great preachers, perhaps stirring up trouble for Paul by saying that he's in prison because he's not preaching the right stuff. God is judging him. We don't know exactly. But Paul is saying there are some people who are preaching Christ out of bad motives, but he rejoices. He says it doesn't matter whether it's Paul doing it, whether it's Apollos, whether it's somebody else. Uh, it doesn't matter as long as Christ is being proclaimed, as long as the gospel is going out. Why? The gospel will produce fruit. Whether it's Johnny Rain, Brian Whittaker, anybody, if Christ is being proclaimed, he rejoices. Why? Because the gospel will bear fruit. All of this is to say, Paul finds joy, he finds contentedness, he finds happiness, he rejoices, verse 18, because the gospel will always bear fruit in the world, no matter what we're going through. That's the first reason, he says, uh, that we can find joy. The gospel produces fruit. The second reason uh, that Paul gives that we can find joy is the gospel provides a future. The gospel provides for us a future. Just look at the future we have, uh, verse 6. Carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Or verse 10, pure and blameless uh, for the day of Christ. There is a day, a day of Christ to come. When Jesus will return, he will raise us up bodily and we will go to live with him in a new world, a new creation. It is his day, secured uh, by the gospel. Jesus has died for our sins. He's risen again. He's ascended and he will one day return and we will have that day, a day where we will live forever in the presence uh, of God. And that hope, that future that awaits all of us if we trust in Jesus, well, that future gives Paul hope in the present. Verse 18 and 19. I will rejoice, I'll continue to rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. Uh, Paul says uh, he has hope of deliverance. Now, I think that deliverance is not uh, just talking about deliverance from prison. Paul doesn't know that he'll be delivered from prison, but he'll be delivered on that final day. That's why you might have a footnote saying it could be deliverance, it could be vindication or salvation. But he says that he will be uh, delivered on that final day. How? Well, he says, verse 19, it's through prayer and the Spirit. He's talking about the gospel, of course. The gospel uh, secures prayer. It gives us a means of being able to pray. We're reconciled to God as our Father. Uh, we come in the name of Jesus because of his death on our behalf. Prayer is only effective because of the gospel. And the Spirit has been given to us because of the gospel, because Jesus has died, taken away our sins. He has ascended uh, to heaven and he has sent the Spirit. We have prayer and the Spirit through the gospel. It is the gospel that gives Paul confidence that he will be delivered. And because he'll be delivered, because he has this wonderful future ahead of him, he knows that whatever happens, Christ will be exalted. Christ will be glorified. Verse 20 and 21, he says, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, to die is gain. Uh, Paul valued Paul treasured Jesus above everything else. He loved Jesus more than anything else in this world. And therefore, he says, to live is for Jesus, to die is gain. It is gain because it is better by far you go into the presence of Jesus and be with him forever. And when you go into the presence of Jesus, you will glorify Jesus, he says. We will exalt in Jesus. And the attitude 
of treasuring Jesus above everything else, well, that attitude in death is a witness. It glorifies God amongst those who are around him. Presumably the whole palace guard, if Paul dies in prison, will see that he valued Christ above even his own life. Christ will be exalted. Paul is saying, no matter what happens in his life, uh, he will rejoice because of the gospel. It produces fruit and it provides a wonderful future. Now, uh, during lockdown, we've uh, been listening to lots of music with the kids. And one song that we've been listening to lots has been Miley Cyrus, The Climb. Now, it's a song which is all about sort of the, the mountains, getting over the mountains, the hills of life. And she says this. She sings. I'm not going to sing it. I'm just going to read it. She says, ain't about how fast I get there. Ain't about what's waiting on the other side. It's the climb. She says right at the end, it's all about the climb. Keep the faith. Keep your faith. Now, I'm not suggesting for a second uh, that Miley Cyrus had read Philippians chapter one as she was singing that song. But there's something of that here. The mountains that we get uh, in life, the hills that we have to climb over, how should we respond? Verse 27. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you or hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel. Uh, Paul says uh, they ought to respond, how? By standing firm. Whatever happens, uh, whatever happens, live a life, uh, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel by standing firm. Now, uh, it's not so much even keep going, although there's an element of that in um, striving together, and we'll see that in chapter three. But in chapter one and in chapter four, Paul says, stand firm, remain where you are. Not so much keep going, keep, keep sort of plodding on. There is a sense of that, of course, but it's stand still. Uh, endure, remain uh, where you are. Now, Paul is not glib about this. Uh, Paul was suffering in prison. Being in prison in the first century would have been awful. He knows uh, that the, uh, the people have en the church have enemies. Verse 28, there are people who oppose them. He's not glib about the reality of life, uh, but he does say stand firm. Why? Well, verse 28, the end, you will be saved. You see, the gospel uh, provides for them a future, a future of being delivered, of being saved. Not just Paul, but for all of us. One day we will be saved. And what do we need to do? Well, we need to stand firm. You see, it's not uh, the things that we do which contribute to being saved. It's not even us clinging on to Christ and the gospel message that gets us saved. It's the fact that God has got us in his hand. Verse 28, you will be saved and that by God. He will save us. We're not going to save ourselves. He will be faithful and save us. As we come to a close, there is a wonderful bright future ahead of us secured by the gospel and Paul says whatever happens in life perhaps even in the hardest times in financial distress in health issues mental health issues work problems marriage problems they may last for decades but Paul says we can rejoice even in tears we can rejoice because the gospel message is true it bears fruit and it provides a wonderful future for us and because of that Paul says Stand firm. Let's sing in response.